Welcome back to another episode of A Push with Mr. Clark. Today's topic is the coming crisis, the 1850s coming crisis, not your homework coming crisis. But we're talking about stuff that's going to lead towards the Civil War, directly lead the decade right before the Civil War. So that's where we're at. I'm talking about this picture in a little bit. There's a video about this in your Google Classroom, so you can check that out. Uh, the beating of Charles Sumner. I haven't seen this yet, but I thought I would make a meme about this um, because it's been going around the uh, Twitter sphere. But um, I'm, I'm going to watch the movie maybe sometime here during break, The Bird Box. And maybe this will make more sense if you've seen it or seen what's going around the internet. This was made by Harmony McGuffin. She was kind enough to send in some memes about homework over the break. This is another one by Harmony. This is another one by Harmony as well. She messed up on the me, so I tried to fix it over here. And Harmony again. She was on fire with her memes. <laughs> and one more from Harmony. Again, if this is the night before it's due, you're in for a long night. Okay. We're talking about Expansion West. On the top right there, you have the United States as it was in 1800. Soon you'll have the Louisiana Purchase under Jefferson, which will double that size of the United States. But if you remember, up here in this Great Lakes region above the Ohio River, I don't know if you can see the cursor, if I'm moving the cursor, if that's recorded or not, but I'm trying to move the cursor up there by the Great Lakes. That was closed off to slavery. It was the Northwest Ordinance that said no more slaves going to be up here. The South decided then to just extend their territories, but then after a while decided to make new states out of the South. They did not abide by the Northwest Territory, and they did their own kind of thing. So then at the bottom there, you can see the map that has the United States in 1850. Still much of that Louisiana territory, unorganized, as far as a territory, um, people didn't stay or live there. A lot of the Plains Indians were still there. But Texas is formed, and you have the Utah and New Mexico territories, California, we're going to talk about that today, how it gets into uh, admitted into the Union, and then you have all those people that were going to Oregon. So you have quite an expansion of the United States from 1800 to 1850. The population will increase dramatically as well, going from 5.3 million people to 23 million people living in the United States. We talked about the majority of those being the immigrants coming from Europe. Uh, yes, coming from Asia and Latin America as well, but mostly the Germans and the Irish and the British still coming across, a little bit of the French too. So you have 16 states in 1800, and you have 31 states by 1850. Throughout that whole time, they tried to keep the balance of slavery between North and South equal within its representation, at least in the Senate. Now, you have half of the population living west of the Appalachian Mountains. So this West really becomes a critical point in United States history as it's expanded beyond where most of the people are living, and now people are shifting out into that area uh, changing the, uh, the power, the political power, uh, moving west, and then what do they do with that territory? Is it going to be free, or is it going to be slave? That will be the coming crisis. So, we're done with the chapter. Oh, just kidding. Um, it's not moving, so, hello. Let's do, oh, we've got nothing. So, command escape, 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 escape! Where's Dory when I need her? Come on. Let's let's try that. No. Okay, here we go. Bam. 
Does this work? Bingo. Saved the recording. Got the United States 1850. The North. Manufacturing only second to Great Britain by 1850. By the end of the century, I'm going to be number one in manufacturing. So quite quickly, the North has taken over. Originally with those textile mills, Samuel Slater, the factories, and all that kind of stuff, bringing the women in, then the Irish, the Germans, low-skilled, and all that stuff. So the West, all those people moving out westward that had a little bit more money, were able to try to farm and do their independent thing out west. Uh, they're going to trade, and most of that stuff will not be for consumption, but for, for business, for trade. Then the South, in this farther westward expansion, and this continued um, global trade that's happening, their power will diminish. Cotton was king. But in 1850, cotton is not so much king anymore. It's still the number one export, but... Other places are being able to find it um, in Africa, in India, in other Asian parts of uh, the world in which cotton is being grown and then being transported uh, into Europe much cheaper than it was coming from the south part of the United States. So slavery becomes a major contention and conflict um, politically moving westward. The south, their intent is to protect their way of life. Their way of life includes slaves. They consider them property, and by doing so, that will put a lot of fear into Northerners and Westerners about the rights to property and what government can do to personal property. They are really upset at all of these literary movements that we talked about in previous chapters, the Transcendentalists um, and the Realists and these people that are, are describing slavery uh, in a different light than it was before. So, uh, trying to stop that from happening. The North relies on personal liberty, relies on freedom and choice and this free labor system that existed. And many people thought that uh, the South's way of life was was a way of the, of the past, not a way of the future. So those will, will come into clash here. They both care about their way of life, and they want it preserved. Therefore, they must, in order to preserve it, in order to, for it to continue, they must impose it upon the West territories. Otherwise, their way of life could die out. So, that enters in these four guys as main actors in this Compromise of 1850. And you'll need to know this for your quiz. This is a big one. There's several things that we need to talk about in here. But you have some old guys that are dying here. Uh, Henry Clay, the great compromiser, the last mm, couple more years, die in 1852. Calhoun dies this year of 1850, not this year of 2018. Um, Daniel Webster, and then a new guy on the on the scene is uh, Stephen Douglas, and we're going to learn a, a more about him as he kind of takes the mantle of uh, expansion west and political power. So the Compromise of 1850, this is what you need to know. California enters as a free state. Why do they get to this? They skip the whole territory thing. They're the only one that's ever skipped this uh, territory uh, progress uh, process, uh, is a better word, uh, of entering into uh, the United States. So in 1850, because of that population boom in 1849, they will enter as a free state, also protect all that good stuff, as in gold, um, for the United States. That then leads towards popular sovereignty, this new idea or this up-and-coming idea, more popular idea. I was trying to avoid that, but it's popular sovereignty, so it became more popular. Uh, I don't know. The Utah and New Mexico territories that were gained in the Mexican-American War uh, will allow people to choose if the majority is for free um, states to occupy that territory, then those will be free. If it is uh, the majority of people that want slaves, then they become the majority that leads towards slaves as a part of the Constitution for each one of those states. There are other parts of this that we kind of need to know, but not really. So that shape of Texas that's strange is because of this compromise of 1850. It used to go much higher. I think there's a map here. There it is. So all of this used to be Texas territory that's uh, in these little polka dots. 
that went into New Mexico and Colorado. And that 3630 line that was part of the Missouri Compromise cuts off the top of Texas. So that then leads towards the, the shape of those other ones. So they give up Texas. California becomes a free state. Popular sovereignty for the new territories of Utah and New Mexico. And then the U.S. assumes $10 million of Texas pre-annexation debt. So the United States will absorb that. Texas gives up its land and takes $10 million to pay off its debt. The slave trade ends in Washington, D.C. So no longer is it legal uh, to trade slaves and sell slaves in Washington, D.C. It's a federal area, uh, not a state. So this was a way in which it starts to move forward in this attempt to end slavery. Uh, they could end it in federal places. They could not end it in states through the federal government because this is a compromise of the federal government. So that's a precursor to things here. But the big victory for the South in this compromise of 1850 is this fugitive slave law. And you need to know this for your quiz. Know what the fugitive slave law is. There's a video on it. You can watch that. Um, this is the link to it. Maybe. Nope. It's in there. Trust me. Um, just find it in the Google Classroom. But the Fugitive Slave Law then becomes endorsed by the federal government. It's a federal agency that is designed to find former slaves and send them back to the South. Remember that they think of them as property. So look, property that's run away, property that has been lost, property that needs to be returned. That's the thinking here. So... Returning the property then, the federal government is responsible for. They go into the north, and they search out people identified by the color of their skin uh, to possibly be slaves. This will lead towards all kinds of problems. So, U.S. commissioners um, created by this federal uh, fugitive slave law become part of this federal agency to uh, issue warrants for runaway slaves, bring them to court, and possibly send them back to the South. In this, there is no trial by jury. It's completely a judge's decision whether they are a, sl a former slave or not. The citizens then are supposed to help in recovering these runaways. They're not supposed to resist. They're supposed to identify and help and alert authorities uh, where they're could be a possible theft, as they refer to it as, of their property. The penalty help, helping runaways punish those severely, a $1,000 fine and six months in jail if you were not helping, um, if you were uh, hiding these uh, former slaves or uh, avoiding the law in some way. There's the link to it, so you can look at that link, or you can uh, just click on it in the Google Classroom. So these U.S. Marshals, then, if they didn't do their job, could be fined $1,000 and sued for the value of their slave. So there's a lot of pressure on them to just gather up anybody that was possible, again, by the color of their skin, to be a, a former slave. So a lot of free blacks got detained, harassed, arrested, um, accused during this time of the 1850s because of this fugitive slave law. Here's its effects. An era of slave hunting and kidnapping. If you ever seen the movie Twelve Years a Slave, um, the main character was a free African American who lived in the North and was captured within this fugitive slave law, sent to the South, never had been to the South, was uh, turned into being a slave, and uh, eventually got his freedom, but for twelve years uh, a slave. Some of the states in the North passed personal liberty laws. This is another attempt at nullification. If you remember the nullification crisis with the tariffs in the South, the Alien and Sedition Acts, during Adams' time, this is another attempt by states, this time in the North, to say we will not follow federal law. Uh, it didn't work that well. There's a Supreme Court case that uh, decides some of this constitutionality of the fugitive slave law. In Abelman versus Booth, there was a uh, hiding of a uh, free black man 
and uh, a riot ensued, and uh, Abelman uh, was uh, arrested, uh, a white man that uh, was hiding uh, this uh, possible former slave, and uh, he was arrested for that. But anyways, don't remember what what it does. Abelman versus dude. Up, uh, Abelman versus dude. Abelman versus Booth uh, upheld the constitutionality of the Fugitive Slave Act. Shaley, you probably laughed at that one. Okay, Harry Beecher Stowe. She's going to write a book. This is one of the nine daughters of uh, Lyman Beecher, the preacher from previous chapters that we talked about. And her book is Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know this for your quiz as well. And she writes this book that will inspire uh, more abolitionist and anti-slavery movements to to do something about uh, what was happening with slavery in the South. So this specifically um, shows the brutality of slavery. Other books did it as well, but this one did it as far as the best timing of this whole thing with 1852, um, where people picked it up, read it, and were moved by it, and uh, formed these organizations to uh, attack slavery. So it caused action and growth of the abolitionist movement. And the South hates this book, hates all kinds of literature that um, depict the, the South as evil, uh, as monsters, as uh, slavery, as this terrible way of living. Um, and they, they spin it into a different, uh, a different light. So let's talk about national politics. How do these things affect national politics? Literary movements, abolitionist movements, what does it do to politicians, what does it do to philosophies, what does it do to all kinds of new ideas. Remember that the West is the key to understanding this. Um, moving out West is, the, is shaping political power. Okay? So the election of 1852, you have two major candidates. Um, Winfield Scott is a Whig. The Whigs are still around. The Whigs are going to turn into the Republican Party in a, by the end of the decade, really by the next election, 1856. Uh, pretty cool nickname, Old Fuss and Feathers. He was the guy from uh, the Mexican-American War, one of the heroes of uh, Mexico City within the, the capture and victory there. So he is anti-slavery, uh, but he doesn't speak so well. He's not much of the uh, words with the speaking so much. Then Franklin Pierce uh, kind of comes out of nowhere. Uh, to the same way kind of Polk did during the uh, election of 1844. War hero, that's key. Uh, people are looking since Jackson's time as this war hero is the theme. Somebody that stands out as a hero of the nation, not just of their political party, but of the nation to try to draw people into voting for that person. So actually served under Winfield Scott and was the opposite then. He was a pro-slavery candidate. So you have that as the major theme, slavery, and you still have this expansion west. And um, either you, you vote for the known anti-slavery candidate or this kind of unknown war hero, Franklin Pierce, uh, arriving on this national political platform of pro-slavery. The other things that are happening here within national politics is with immigration and continuing moving west. You have nativism as this uh, form of ideas that favor native inhabitants over immigrants. So a political party formed specifically around this. The, the national politics of the time, you think today is crazy? The 1850s was uh, immensely crazy for all of the confusion of finding answers to, to life. Um, so, people that wanted to ignore the issue of slavery and wanted to hold on to what was the United States um, culture and economy, politics, whatever it was, as defined from the United States from the beginnings to, to now, to 1850, those people would be attracted to this American party. Or they were known as the Know Nothing Party. It's the only question you can get right on the quiz by knowing nothing. Yes, it's on the quiz. Okay. The only question you can know by knowing nothing you can get right. So this is the anti-immigrant party. Nothing to do with slavery. There's some Whigs. There's some Democrats. They become focused on anti-immigrant 
all the problems that they saw within the Germans and the Irish and the French and these other groups coming in with these small enclaves of uh, urban areas that uh, were decimated by poverty and crime and just they, they wanted to have some sort of answer to that. So anytime you ask them about anything else, I know nothing about that. That's how they got the nickname, Know Nothing Party. Uh, they only focused on nativism, this anti-immigrant uh, feelings. Here's the election of 1852 and its results. Uh, Pierce wins quite easily. Um, the Free Soil Party, and you can see there with the 5% of the vote, uh, that is the idea that all of the new territory would be closed to slavery. So 5%, that's the abolitionist movement basically by 1852. If you were an abolitionist, you probably belonged to the Free Soil Party. Some Whigs, but mostly um, the Free Soil Party or the Liberty Party. Okay, so expanding west, that's the big topic um, that we're looking at here. Further expansion, what does it do? Um, the possibility of slavery and the possibility of uh, expanding the country by resources and land. There was this young American movement. Writers, artists, and politicians who believed in manifest destiny, expansionism, and they wanted to keep going. What was conquered in the 40s, they wanted to continue in the 50s. So you have now Mexico to the south, below them, Guatemala and all the Central American countries. You have out in the Pacific uh, Ocean. You have up to the north, up to uh, Alaska. And you have south in the uh, Caribbean Sea with those islands. So that's where they're looking at as expanding uh, the United States. They were proponents of free trade. So no barriers to trade, no tariffs, that kind of stuff. They believed in modern infrastructure. So these there's some ideas of Whigs here. Um, with the American system and Henry Clay to support capitalism. They include these people um, as writers. William Walker, Herman Melville, he's the Moby Dick guy, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Scarlet Letter, Stephen Douglas, our new political um, star of the 1850s. We'll get to him. Let's talk about Walker here first. So Walker, uh, as an extreme expansionist, will go into... Nicaragua and Honduras. You don't have to write them down, but um, they're using military force. So he has people with guns, and they're going down into Nicaragua, and they're getting involved in a civil war. So they are funded by uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who we'll talk about in the next chapter, is one of the wealthiest men of the uh, 1800s. A lot of this railroad stuff and banks and being funded by uh, or, or being invested by Cornell. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. So he be becomes involved in a civil war in Nicaragua and eventually takes power, becomes the president of Nicaragua. And Pierce recognizes him as the president of Nicaragua. Later on, he's removed by rebellions, and so he moves on to Honduras. And in Honduras, he does the same thing. He gets involved in a civil war, but eventually is killed by uh, rebels in the firing squad. So that one fails, but... The attempt is important. This one, though, is on your quiz, so you need to know this. Austin Manifesto. Pierce actually tries to get Cuba from Spain. Spain had owned Cuba. It's part of its colony, part of its empire, all the way back to Columbus. So he's attempting to either see how the world would respond, nations, other nations would respond to the acquisition of um Cuba by the United States. Now it belongs to Spain. So Spain's a big player in this world of foreign affairs. If it was just Spain, if it was just Cuba by itself, probably would have been no problem. But because it's owned by Spain, they're testing the waters here to see can we can we do something about expanding um, into colonizers of larger powers? then or or do we just ignore it and just do it ourselves so sends people to talk and find out what would happen if the united states attempted to buy or defeat spain to acquire cuba and it doesn't work it it become it backfires so discredited as a plot by southerners to increase slave power it looks bad for pierce and it looks bad for southern politicians 
uh, and the North exposes this Austin Manifesto as this uh, plot to increase uh, slavery. Then you have expansion far west, beyond the uh, Pacific into places like Japan. So Commodore Perry, and you'll remember this from your world history days, uh, with the age of the samurai and the Tokugawa shogunate, um, as they closed off Japan for 250 years. They didn't let anybody in and they didn't let anybody out. Well, Commodore Matthew Perry wants to make friends with Japan. Did you get the joke? Matthew Perry, he was the character on Friends. Chandler, not Chandler, uh, was he Chandler? I don't know, he was one of the characters. Anyways, um, making friends with Japan, so Friends, the show. All right, didn't work. All right, so he just sits out in the harbor and is persistent on talking with Japan about the possibility of becoming some sort of trade partners. And eventually, they talk to the emperor and meet with them and leads towards the opening up of Japan to foreigners, specifically those coming from the United States. Leads to a treaty in 1854 that is known as the Kanagawa Treaty, peace and friendship between the United States and Japan. This is going to be the end of the samurai. If you've ever seen the movie with Tom Cruise, The Last Samurai, the United States comes and trains military to be able to defeat the samurai and uh, changes Japan's future forever. All right, these other things you don't need to know, but two ports for American ships. American ships get help, possibly from Japan, if they get shipwrecked. Um, and the bigger part is that it will allow um, all kinds of supplies for these ships that are going across to farther reaches of Asia. Okay, big category here now again, the West as the catalyst to the Civil War. Uh, you probably didn't have time to write that down. The West as a catalyst to the Civil War. What does catalyst mean? It means here that it's, they're the critical part. Like, the West, if the West doesn't exist, probably no Civil War. The balance would have stayed there. Maybe something would have changed much later. But this, the West accelerates the, the path to the Civil War. Here's how it does it. This is what you need to know for your quiz, too. This is Stephen Douglas. The Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 will try to build a railroad um, through Congress's approval, um, a railroad that connects then the Midwest with the Pacific through the Kansas Territory. So it's just a territory, and they want to connect a railroad then through this area. That will bring people, that will bring goods, that will bring commerce and business and all kinds of stuff. So in that, uh, he proposes that the people that arrive in this territory, which will then be eventually become a state, will use popular sovereignty. The Supreme Court had already struck down the Missouri Compromise. We'll get to the Supreme Court decisions in a little bit. But that opens the door for popular sovereignty in these unorganized territories. So that 3630 line that went up, that once was closed off to slavery, is now reopened to slavery or freedom through this idea of popular sovereignty. So Missouri, then, you have people coming across the border that will vote illegally. They live in Missouri, but they're willing to come across and vote for slavery to continue to expand uh, into that territory westward and above that previously uh, 3630 line that was established. It will also cause then northern abolitionists to come into the Kansas-Nebraska territory and they're known as Jayhawks and that's where you get the Kansas um, University Jayhawks uh, nickname. This will also lead towards the birth of the Republican Party. So there's a lot of stuff happening right here in 1854 with this Kansas-Nebraska Act. It starts with a railroad, proposing the railroad come in, it's going to bring people, it's going to bring conflict, and it'll lead towards bleeding Kansas. So remember this for your quiz, Kansas-Nebraska Act, Stephen Douglas. This is the area we're talking about. This used to be the 3630 line that said all of this was closed to slavery. The Supreme Court says, no, you can't do that, therefore opens up this possibility of slavery expanding. Missouri, people moved across, voted illegally. And people from the north came in these areas, moved down into here, and tried to vote uh, out slavery within this popular sovereignty. These are the rail lines. Okay, so Kansas City, Missouri Pacific, 
these ones trying to get in through here as the Kansas Pacific. That's what they want to build. This is showing you the territories. So Missouri, Kansas Territory, and the distance between. All right, so it leads to Kansas then in 1856 as major battleground. This is the Civil War before the Civil War. This is, it, it, it is a Civil War. This is people from the United States fighting against each other over territory in major, major battles. A lot of people die. So violence and murder um, happen within these pro-slavery uh, established places and these anti-slavery established places, and they will fight each other to the death. Um, known as Bleeding Kansas, so remember this for your quiz. Pro-slavery groups set up their, um, their capital at Lecompton, not Compton, but Lake Compton, um, and they dropped a, a constitution with slavery and submit it to the uh, Congress for it to be approved so that they can be added as a slave state. Those pro-slavery groups attack and kill uh, property and people uh, at Lawrence, Kansas. Anti-slavery groups respond by retaliating and killing those pro-slavery groups at, um, led by John Brown. So John Brown's going to be a major character here that we need to uh, know. He'll be on the quiz, too. We'll talk more about him in a second. But President Pierce, at the time, ignores what's going on in Kansas and will divide this Democrat party into uh, regional lines, North Democrats and Southern Democrats. Okay, so the, the, the sweeping aside of what's happening in Kansas will split the country uh, by political party, by regions. This is another thing that adds to that, which is the beating of Charles Sumner. Uh, it will happen on the floor of the Senate uh, in 1856. There's a good video on this. It's in the Google Classroom. The link is down there at the bottom. Uh, I suggest you watch this so you can get a little bit more understanding of what's happening here. It leads to our meme for today. Thought it was pretty good. I made that one myself. Okay, so then you have the election of 1856. Pierce has gotten into a lot of trouble. Uh, he's viewed uh, negatively. He's basically split the party in two uh, because of the Austin Manifesto, what's happened down there with William Walker and Nicaragua and Honduras, and ignoring what's happening out in Kansas. So you have a new candidate here, James Buchanan from the Democrat Party, pro-slavery, uh, believes in popular sovereignty, this democratic way of slavery or freedom being able to be chosen by people. He served as Secretary of the State, uh, so he has a, a pretty decent uh, resume as far as background in politics. He's not an, an unknown like Pierce was. Uh, and he was gone during most of this. So as he comes back uh, to the country, um, he, he will be kind of that person that was not attached to any of the problems that existed. Then you have the um, anti-immigrant party, who is led by Millard Fillmore, who was president before. Um, who uh, took over, uh, and uh, he will lead the American Party, or the Know Nothing Party, and uh, they ignore completely the issue of slavery. It's all focused on anti-immigrant uh, issues. Then you have the birth of the Republican Party, John C. Fremont. He was the Bear Flag Revolt guy, um, and they, they are against this uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act. Um, they they looked at the popular sovereignty as a major problem and um, any of these other possibilities of expansion. They need to figure out, they believe figuring out what's existing uh, is most important and not continue to expand and create more problems. So here's the results. New Buchanan's going to win in a close one. Um, the Know Nothing Party, this third party, will have uh, an impact even though it doesn't look like it. Um, because many of them will be northerners uh, and support these things that are happening in the north because of immigration. So it will lead towards Fremont not, uh, not getting too many votes in those border uh, states. And then the other thing is the, the Republican Party is brand new. So is the uh, Know Nothing Party. They're just birthed here um, in the 1850s, but the Democrat Party has been around for a long time mostly solidified by Jackson. So 
even though it's close, um, you can see this, the national politics starting to, politics starting to shift uh, towards power in the north, even though it doesn't really look like it in this election. Then you have the Supreme Court case that will be very important. You'll need to know this for your quiz. is the one on Dred Scott. So he, Dred Scott was a slave, and he was uh, taken with his master into Wisconsin and lived in Wisconsin for two years. Wisconsin doesn't have slavery. So the idea here is once free, always free. And that's what the lower court granted him. So not the Supreme Court, but lower federal courts said there's no slavery in Wisconsin, therefore you were living there for two years, you're no longer a slave. When he comes back to Missouri, then they, he, that, that uh, idea of whether he's a slave or not then gets thrown into uh, the courts. So, goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, Roger Taney is the uh, Chief Justice here, and um, he will be in charge of delivering the decision. And the decision is that blacks were not citizens in the United States, therefore they could not sue in the court of uh, law. So basically throws out the decision uh, because Dred Scott could not be protected by the law because he was not a citizen. Therefore upholding this um, idea of slavery. So leads towards some Lincoln-Douglas debates, Stephen Douglas, and now you have the arrival of Abraham Lincoln on the national political scene. And these are also known as the Great Debates of 1858. It's over the senatorship of Illinois, and Lincoln will lose to Douglas, but because of this, uh, he will become popular. And so the idea is, uh, or the focus here is uh, on slavery, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, what it's caused, popular sovereignty, and this Dred Scott case. All of this gets debated here between Lincoln and Douglas uh, for this senator race in Illinois, which creates national attention. Douglas will win. Um, and this idea of popular sovereignty uh, will continue. But Lincoln is heavily against all of this popular sovereignty business. So Kansas becomes admitted as a free state. This um, denial of uh, the Lecompton Constitution leads towards popular sovereignty choosing to eliminate slavery from Kansas. This is the only state in the United States history that uses popular sovereignty to decide its fate of slave or free and it gets admitted as the Union as the majority of people then voted out slavery from Kansas. Alright, then it leads towards John Brown. John Brown was a guy involved in the defense of anti-slavery movements in Kansas, and he will take this to the extreme in 1859 on Harper's Ferry. So this is going to be on your quiz too. His idea is to start a slave uprising in the South. He wants to arm slaves so that they can fight for their freedom. Um, imagine if the Second Amendment applied to um, slaves at this point in time. That is what John Brown is trying to do. Um, the problem is, the there's several problems. Uh, it's not going to work. The logistics is just not possible, and the resistance is too strong in the South. But it will be a precursor to the Civil War, because it's another threat against the um, way of life in the South. So his plan is to raid the armory at Harpers Ferry, Virginia, and supply the slaves with weapons. Robert E. Lee and the military forces that are there will capture Brown and his sons and uh, kill most of the men. And John Brown's fate is a hanging. And you can see all of this stuff in that um, clip that I put up on the uh, Google Classroom as well. The effects of the John Brown raid is he seen as a hero in the North, they mourn his death, and the South sees him as a severe threat to the future of their way of life. So, that are those, this, whatever. Um, these things are the causes of the Civil War. The coming crisis of the 50s will lead towards Lincoln's election in 1860, and then Civil War. That is posted. You can check out now all of these videos. Um, happy A pushing and uh, hope you enjoyed your break. Um, and I'll see you when we get back. We got a quiz. There's some helper stuff on the quiz 
on the next chapter as well. So watch the stuff on the Civil War. On that one, you may want to put the um, notes from the Google Classroom side by side with the video um, because I put stuff in red on the notes but not on the video itself. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, there's more videos here that you can check out. We're not going to talk about the American Renaissance. Oh, okay. Bye-bye.